Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Protective effect of a novel non-competitive interleukin-1 receptor bias ligand in an infection and inflammation-induced preterm birth as well as in fetal injury and developmental outcomes. Presented by Dr. Sylvian Shemtob, a professor of pediatrics, ophthalmology, optometry, and pharmacology at University of Montreal, an adjunct professor of pharmacology at McGill University, and the director of ophthalmology research at University of Montreal. I'm Susie Valdez, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on the Help Desk button located at the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use that Ask a Question box and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and offers continuing educational credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credit tab located on the right top corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our presenter today, Dr. Sylvian Shemtob. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Good day, everyone. My name is Sylvain Shemtob, and I will be talking to you about um, pre prematurity and labor and adverse outcomes. Prematurity is a major cause of di disability later on in life. Approximately 15 million children are born premature in the world. 1.1 million of these die, unfortunately. In the United States alone, the cost of prematurity amount to approximately $40 billion a year. And so far, in the last 30 years, the rate of prematurity has essentially not changed at all. There are many causes to preterm birth, but the major cause for preterm birth early in gestation, in other words, before 28 weeks until the ages of viability of the fetus, which is approximately 22 to 23 weeks gestation, the main causes apply to inflammation. And in this process, various components are involved in triggering this inflammation. Either alarmins, which are generated endogenously, or bacteria, which actually trigger the formation of certain compounds, which then activate specific receptors, which will trigger an inflammatory process, which then activate and induce a series of proteins called uterine activation proteins, and these will trigger preterm labor and preterm birth. <clears throat> If we actually see on the following slide, we actually can appreciate that a number of inflammatory genes are expressed on chorionic amniotic, chorioamniotic membranes in, from patients that were had uh, labor <clears throat> versus though, those that did not have labor as shown in green. And in red, you can see actually that a number of inflammatory genes are actually induced under the labor process. In a very important study, which was reported by Roberto Romero 
where he investigated the rate of uh, in inflammation, <clears throat> whether it was microbial or sterile inflammation or no inflammation at all, at different gestational ages. And very clearly on that slide, number five, what we can appreciate is that the great majority of labor that occurs early in gestation is associated with inflammation. And that contrasts with labor that occurs much later nearing term in gestation. As you can see, when we're under 30 weeks of gestation, 85% of the labor is associated with inflammation. Whereas when you're near term, 63% are associated with no inflammation. Despite this very important association between inflammation and labor, so far, the only therapies that we have affect only uh, labor per se, but not the inflammatory process that precedes this labor. None of the treatments that we have right now address uterine inflammation. On the following slide, we can appreciate a, a cascade of events that actually in, are initiated by inflammatory stimuli, which then stimulate specific receptors called toll-like receptors, which then induce the formation of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And these then lead to um, uh, an influx of neutrophils, macrophages, and, and T cells. These will then produce more inflammatory mediators, such as prostaglandins and oxytocin receptors. And that will then facilitate the process of myometrial contraction, rupture of membranes, and cervical ripening, which will all lead to the expulsion of the fetus. The current drugs that we have only affect the latter part, in other words, the myometrial contractility. That's the only part that now is affected by labor. But when we actually look at the efficacy of these compounds, they're hardly efficacious. In very interesting studies that have been published over the last couple of years, Ben Moll has demonstrated that in fact when we compare, for example, an oxytocin receptor antagonist to a calcium channel blocker in contractility, we can only extend labor by approximate, uh, sorry, gestation by approximately one week. When we're dealing with labor induction at 23 weeks, this is not a major prolongation of gestation to go from 23 to 24 weeks. And hence, this actually begs the question, what is actually going on prior to this and that we need to tackle these events in order to make a significant impact in reducing preterm birth. And this is where anti-inflammatory agents, the one that I'm gonna be speaking to you in a, in a short while, which is at the top of that slide, slide number seven, called Ridvella, affects interleukin-1 receptors. Other co uh, companies are actually going after other uh, receptors, which are for the prostaglandin F2 alpha receptor just below. As you can see, there's Obziva, Fering, GSK that have an interest in these prostaglandin F2 alpha receptor, given their important role in myometrial contractility. So on the next slide, <clears throat> slide number eight, 
we actually highlight the evidence to support IL-1 importance in preterm labor and perinatal injury. IL-1 is produced by macrophages, by trophoblasts, by decidua in response to bacteria, and its levels are very high in labor. IL-1 amplifies the inflammatory cascade through a feed-forward loop. That means that when IL-1 is produced, it actually acts again on its own receptor, IL-1 receptor, which will then trigger even more IL-1 production and vice versa. In other words, IL-1 feeds itself in the formation of IL-1. IL-1 stimulation leads to the, the induction of uterine activation protein expression, which then lead to myometrial contractility and labor per se. <clears throat> IL-1 alone is able to induce labor. In humans, polymorphisms of interleukin-1 beta, of caspase-1, which leads to its production, as well as of receptor of interleukin-1, affect labor. And this actually highlights the importance, therefore, of IL-1, even in humans. Moreover, in preclinical evaluation, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, namely Kenneret, delays labor induced by IL-1, but not by clinically relevant infectious and non-infectious triggers of the toll-like receptors, which are activated by alarmins and bacteria, which lead to the process of inflammation and downstream of myometrial contractility. Moreover, IL-1 levels increase in the brain during perinatal inflammation, and that has itself is associated with adverse effects in, later on to the, to the newborn. IL-1 also causes brain, microvascular, and parenchymal degeneration, and this is prevented by interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. So to date, there are a number of drugs that affect interleukin-1 activity. There, these drugs are Kineret, Rilonacept, Kanakinumab, as shown on slide number nine. But these drugs have a number of adverse effects, and which actually limits their use. The other thing is that actually they have drawbacks. They're a very large molecule, and they require systemic administration. They're immunogenic. They're very costly, and very importantly, and relevant to this presentation, they do not inhibit labor triggered by relevant toll-like receptor stimulants. Slide number 10. When we actually look at the effects of these compounds, they are classically rilonosep, kanakinumab, and kineret, orthosteric inhibitors. In other words, that they interfere with the actions of the natural ligand, or they mop up the natural ligand if it, was, if it is an antibody. And in slide number 10, one can appreciate that such a competitive inhibitor would essentially act on the orthosteric site where the ligand is actually sits on and would interfere with all the signals associated with an activation of that receptor by the ligand. Ideally, it would be, it would be ideal if actually we had compounds that would interfere with some signals associated with the receptor, but then actually preserve other signals which may be best left untouched. And that would be the case of allosteric antagonists as seen on the right side of the schematic diagram. These allosteric antagonists do not actually interfere directly with the orthosteric binding site of where the ligand is acting, but it's actually on a remote, acting on a remote site. As a result, it affects some of the signals associated with that ligand but it actually then preserves also other signals. <clears throat> 
Hence the advantages of allosteric modulators. They have an enhanced specificity, an enhanced selectivity, diminished side effects and tolerance, and diminished inter-individual kinetics as they could be, for example, peptides and not metabolized, and therefore they are dependent on mainly renal elimination or protease elimination. They're stable and are much smaller. <clears throat> Slide number 11. So one of the interesting things that we have done is that we decided <clears throat> that to look at loop and hinge regions of receptors and actually mimic these regions by reproducing a the peptide sequence of that region. And we did that in an all D conformation in order to actually stabilize the peptide against endogenous proteases, as shown on slide number 11. And we did that for many receptors, as you can see, appreciate that on slide number 12. We did that for prostaglandin F2 alpha receptor, which is called FP and shown here on the right side of slide number 12, where we actually looked at <clears throat> divide, derived peptides from various juxtamembranous regions of the prostaglandin F2 alpha receptor. And we identified one from the second extracellular loop, which is actually circled on that diagram. And that one turned out to be quite effective. And moreover, it's a, it was even actually taken into clinical trials and shown to be effective. And that's where it's at right now. But it's not a comp, it's a compound that we licensed <clears throat> to a company. Another example is for vasopressin 2 receptor for diabetes insipidus. We utilized the same approach and were able to find a peptide, a small peptide, which was effective. The same happened for the prostaglandin E2, EP4 receptor for acute renal injury. And more recently, we also showed it for the chemokine CCR2 receptor in acute inflammation. We then applied this approach to more, to different type of receptors, not G protein coupled receptors as the, is the case for FP, V2R, EP4, and CCR2, but actually for tyrosine kinase receptors as interleukin-23 and interleukin-1 receptor. And we were able to show that. Moreover, this technology was actually tested by a company, and they tested it on eight other targets and shown it to be effective. So let's move on to slide number 13. The foc because the focus is really going to be on IL-1, given the importance of IL-1 in inflammation, and for the sake of this presentation, on preterm labor and adverse effects to the fetus. So on slide number 13, we actually have depicted in a ribbon-like manner the interleukin-1 receptor subunits. The turquoise is the interleukin-1 receptor 1, the gold is the interleukin-1 receptor accessory protein. One actually interleukin-1, which is in magenta purple, interacts with interleukin-1 receptor 1. Then this unit con changes its conformation to adapt itself to the interleukin-1 receptor accessory protein. And the interleukin-1 receptor accessory protein then triggers a signal and results in induction of a signal triggered by the interleukin-1. So using a similar approach of actually identifying peptides from loop and hinge regions, we actually identified a number of different peptides for the interleukin-1 receptor. But I will focus on one, which is actually of the sequence of Ridvella. R-Y-T-V-E-L-A, and it actually comes from a region which is juxtamembranous between the interleukin-1 receptor accessory protein and the membrane. 
and is shown in blue. We actually labeled this compound, you will see in this presentation, 101.10. We labeled it like that, <clears throat> and I will go, I will use these two terms, Redvella or 101.10. So Redvella actually stands for the sequence of the amino acids, arginine, tyrosine, threonine, valine, glutamate, leucine, alanine. Based on this, we therefore wanted to understand if Ridvella actually affected signals triggered by interleukin-1. Interleukin-1 triggers through two major canonical pathways, the NF-kappa-B pathway and a MAP kinase pathway. So we actually tested, verified, if actually 101.10 affected the NF-kappa-B pathway. And interestingly, we utilized three different approaches to investigate this. We looked at I-kappa-B activation. We looked at HEC blue cells where actually the NF-kappa-B promoter is controlled, is actually uh, the NF-kappa-B promoter controls alkaline phosphatase secretion. And we looked at nuclear translocation of the P65 unit, subunit of the NF-kappa-B. And in all cases, 101.10 did not affect this. But in fact, this turned out to be a very desirable effect because in preterm labor, the newborn is actually highly dependent on innate immunity, which is NF-kappa-B dependent. And because NF-kappa-B is important for immunovigilance, it would be best actually left untouched. And 101.10, contrary to Kinneret, actually does not inhibit IL-1-induced activation of NF-kappa-B, whereas Kinneret suppresses it. On slide number 15, we actually appreciate that, however, 101.10 does affect the MAP kinase pathway, and as well as the Rho kinase, the Rho A kinase pathway. And this is in a dose dependent manner. We could see P38, June kinase, C June, and Rho A activation, which are actually suppressed by 101.10 and as well as Kinneret. Moreover, it is important to point out that this pathway, the, the MAP kinase pathway, which then actually lead to an activation of AP1 uh, and the Rho kinase pathway, inhibition of these pathways interferes with prematurity, as can be appreciated on slide number 15 on the right part, uh, the, the uh, histogram on the right side. So we have a very interesting now effect, which is called biased ligand activity of 101.10. It biases the signal such that it actually interferes with the IL-1 uh, induction of signals, but only for the rho kinase and MAP kinase pathway, but it actually leaves untouched the NF-kappa-B pathway. But this is, however, sufficient actually to interfere with pro-inflammatory gene expression. This is on, shown on slide number 16. Hence, a small aldipeptide is a selective biosignaling allosteric modulator of the interleukin-1 receptor, and it's also effective in several inflammatory models, as we will show you in a few seconds, on slide number 17. So based on this very pronounced efficacy of 101.10 on the MAP kinase pathway and the Rho kinase pathway preserving the NF-kappa-B, 101.10 was actually shown to be effective inflammatory bowel disease, in contact dermatitis, in rheumatoid arthritis, in osteoarthritis, in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathies of the newborn and the adult, in ischemic retinopathies, and in preterm labor. 
And from here on, as of slide number 18, I will actually focus on preterm labor. So for that purpose, we utilize three different models of inflammation-induced preterm labor, preterm birth. You could see on slide number 18, IL-1, lipopolysaccharides LPS, and uh, lipotechoic acid LTA. That was administered at 16 and a half days of gestation and 101.10, Kinneret or vehicle were administered immediately at the same time. And then what we monitored is actually whether these animals delivered preterm or not. <clears throat> the timing of birth. Well, the first thing actually we see is that upon administration of interleukin-1 on slide number 19 to our naked eye without any microscopes, Interleukin-1 causes a, what we see here is actually uterine horns. And on these uterine horns, in the vehicle, you could see the very nice color of these uterine horns with the pups inside the uterine horns. Mm -hmm. Upon administration of interleukin-1, these horns will become very edematous, engorged, and inflamed. But in the presence of Ridvella or 101.10, you could see actually that this inflammation is markedly suppressed in these animals. On slide number tw 20, one, uh, 20, we appreciate actually that indeed Ridvella or 101.10 is able to suppress a number of genes in the uterus. Interleukin-1 is increased, interleukin-6 is increased in the vehicle-treated animals, interleukin-8, MMP9, I, and as well as a prostaglandin synthase type 2, but this is all suppressed. All these inflammatory mediators are suppressed by 101.10, whereas Kinneret does not have any significant effect on any of these genes. Kinneret, which is actually the commercially available compound, also does not have any effect on inflammatory mediators in the newborn mouse itself. So this was done actually, systemic inflammation in blood of the newborn mouse at birth. And you can see in here, interleukin-1 is increased, but it is suppressed by 101.10. Same thing with IL-6, IL-8, prostaglandin H synthase 2, etc. Whereas Kinneret does not suppress this. On slide number 22, we can appreciate that Redvella 101.10 is able to prevent prematurity induced by IL-1, induced by lipo lipotechoic acid, and induced by lipopolysaccharide. The lipotechoic acid mimics a gram-positive type of bacterial infection, whereas the lipopolysaccharide mimics a gram-negative type of infection, which then actually triggers the toll-like receptors in both cases for the LTA as well as the LPS. Mm -hmm. In all cases, Ridvella is able actually to significantly diminish the rate of prematurity induced by these triggers of inflammation, whereas Kinneret is not able to do so. Moreover, on slide number 23, one can appreciate that even when we administer Redvella a few hours after the induction of inflammation, and we selected four hours because two to four hours is the peak of inflammation after lipopolysaccharide, you could see that actually on, on slide number 23, on the timing of delivery graph, we could see that we can bring it with Ridvella essentially to the same thing as the control. Whereas in the case of the vehicle, we're really prematurity. There is prematurity in the vehicle-treated animals. 
So all in all, what we have shown so far is that Redvella acting via the MAP kinase rho, rho kinase pathway is able to suppress inflammation in the uterus, in the pups, and, all, and it prolongs gestation in these animals, prevents pre preterm birth. But what happens actually to the fetal and newborn outcome? Slide number 24. So we actually pursued these studies along with a colleague of ours, Dr. David Olson and Sarah Robertson. And what we see in here on slide number 25 is that is the number of animals that's, that are born <clears throat> alive. So newborn survival. You can see that in the animals that are treated with interleukin-1, only approximately 30% of the animals survive interleukin-1, secondary to this very pronounced inflammation that I showed you before. In the presence of Ridvella, we actually almost completely are able to prevent the cell death and therefore maintain survival of these animals, whereas Kinneret is not able to do so. And this is appreciated on the pups that you could see here on after 24 hours post interleukin-1 in the presence of vehicle on the top um, images. Whereas in the bottom images, they're all actually lysed. Unfortunately, you, you see lysis of the tissues with blood seeping onto the um, cardboard. Whereas in the presence of Ridvella, the animals are, are actually in good shape and they're not lysed, they're not bleeding, they're not inflamed. So what is the evidence that interleukin-1, slide number 26, is involved in fetal and newborn brain injury? Because if that were the case, then Ridvella would then be a very interesting target, a very interesting um, therapeutic candidate for to target interleukin-1 and preserve not only against pr prematurity, but also the outcome of prematurity, and which is the inflammation associated fetal demise. Indeed, interleukin-1 concentrations are very high in preterm inf infants who develop neurological disability, specifically in chorioamnionitis. Lipopolysaccharide induces high levels of interleukin-1 concentrations in the brain. This is lipopolysaccharide administered during gestation. Interleukin-1 elicits neonatal brain injury and interleukin-1 receptor antagonism prevents inflammatory brain injury. So based on that, we therefore tested whether antenatal inhibition of interleukin-1 using Ridvella would actually pr preserve fetal organ integrity, mainly that of the brain uh, and also other neural tissues, the retina. So on the slide number 27, we appreciate that Ridvella, when administered to DAMS, actually suppresses inflammation of, in, in the brain. It, it does so for interleukin-1, it does so for interleukin-6, it also does it for TNF and interleukin-12. So therefore, Ridvella is actually able to, to diminish the inflammation induced by LPS in the brain. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the administration of interleukin-1 leads to, to, to the, um, to the fetus, to, uh, to uh, intrauterine horn interleukin-1 leads to a damage of the brain resulting in a decrease in the weight of the brain. As you could see on the slide number 28, on the top left-hand corner, there's a histogram of brain weight. Upon I interleukin-1, you have 100 milligram decrease in the brain weight. In other words, over 30, 
33% decrease in the brain weight. Redvella is able to preserve this kinneret partially, as we've shown. Interestingly, this is associated with actually the effects of, of Redvella with a preservation of the microvascular integrity. So by doing so, then you're also able to preserve the parenchymal integrity in these animals. We then decided if that is the case, that Rizvela is able to preserve the microvasculature and the brain weight, in, then we should be able to preserve as well the function of the brain. So we tested that utilizing a, an approach called visual evoke potential, where we actually, upon a flash of light, we trigger a response, a, a signal response in the brain, which then can be recorded in the occipital, occipital uh, lobe. And we did that, and we can actually appreciate this very, this very effect that interleukin-1 causes a suppression of the P2 amplitude of the visual evoked response. This is actually preserved by 101.10 and to a lesser extent by Kinneret. Moreover, you could see on the histogram immediately adjacent to the P2 amplitude where it says percent of affected mice, that 100% of the mice that were actually received interleukin-1 were affected whereas none of the mice that received 101.10 were affected. Important to point out that all of these studies were conducted in a double-blind manner. Rigvela, therefore, preserves brain, brain integrity. So one of the questions that was raised, we raised was, well, does it cross the placenta? Does it reach the fetal brain? Interestingly, we looked at that. And in fact, what we did is we labeled Redvella 101.10 with FITC. And you can see actually on the slide number 29 that FITC labeled, uh, sorry, 101.10 labeled with FITC actually um, distributes very nicely to the maternal side of the placenta, but not so much to the fetal side of the placenta. And also on fetal brain, on the histogram, we can, in fact, we did not detect any 101.10 significantly on the, in, in these fetal brains. So essentially, 101.10 does not cross the placenta, but it does protect the fetus and we'll, we'll come back to that. Another element that we wanted to study is actually, oops, is whether 101 Ridvella or 101.10 protects the retinal vasculature, which is actually, this is on slide number 30, which is another neural tissue. Since retinopathy of prematurity is one of the complications of very preterm birth, as is the case with uh, uh, neuro neurodevelopmental disabilities is for the preterms mm -hmm. and corium neonitis. So we could see in here that upon administration of interleukin-1 to the dams, we actually have an impairment in vascular development even starting at the first day of life, this is actually, however, preserved by 101.10 as well as by Kinneret. And one can appreciate it even more when at P15, when at P15, we could see that actually a, the vascular density is actually significantly affected by interleukin 1, but it is not but it's actually preserved by in animals that were treated with Ridvella. If we now then look at um, Ridvella, another important element which is, could be affected 
you could see actually that Rivella also preserves the choroid, which is the vascular tissue that supports photoreceptor um, nutrient and oxygen supply. And once again, 101.10 is able to fully preserve this. And finally, along the same lines, if that is the case, if 101.10 is able to preserve the vascular integrity of the retina, it should be able to preserve also its function. So for that purpose, we conducted electroretinograms on these animals. And we can appreciate on slide number 32 that the B wave of the electro, which is a function of the inner retina, is significantly diminished in amplitude by interleukin-1, and this is preserved by 101.10, as well as Kinneret. But Kinneret, actually, if you remember, does not prevent labor per se. So with 101.10, one is able, therefore, to prolong gestation and also have a direct effect in preserving the integrity of the fetal tissues. So in summary, when we compare antenatal 101.10 to Kinneret on slide number 33, Ridvella is able to prolong gestation and prevent preterm birth. This is not the case with Kinneret. Ridvella is able to actually prevent, uh, 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 preserve neonatal survival. This is not the case with Kinneret. It is able to preserve brain integrity. It is able to protect and I didn't show you this, lung and parenchymal integrity, as well as that of the gut, and as I showed you, also ocular structural and functional integrity. So in summary, slide number 34, Ridvella displays pharmacologic selectivity by favoring bias signaling. It affects some, but not all pathways coupled to interleukin-1 receptor. Specifically, it preserves the NF-kappa B pathway, important in immunovigilance. Ridvella has been shown in different studies to exert anti-inflammatory properties in distinct conditions. More relevantly, in this case, as it applies to preterm labor, in blinded studies, Ridvella has been shown to diminish gestational tissue inflammation, to prolong gestation induced by different inflammatory stimuli, to enhance pup survival and improve outcome, and to improve newborn outcome, including preservation of organ and histology and function, and resulting in normal growth trajectory. In vitro and in vivo studies were confirmed by separate laboratories, and thus, Ridvella is a first-in-class therapeutic candidate in the prevention and arrest of preterm birth. Slide number 34, 35, I would like actually to thank our collaborators and consultants for this work that was done and actually included many people. Dr. David Olson from the University of Alberta in Canada, Dr. Bill Lubell, our chemist, Dr. Sarah Robertson, a renowned uh, preterm labor uh, specialist from University of Adelaide in Australia, Dr. Shin Ni, an obstetrician and scientist at Shanghai University in China, Dr. Jeff Keelan, Dr. Alistair Gunn, Dr. Christina Adams Waldorf from the University of Washington, Dr. David Stevenson from the Stanford University, and other people who are involved in the clinical development perspective of this discovery, Dr. Jane Norman, Brian Mitchell, Roberto Romero, Emmanuel Bijot, and Diane Kalina. And we thank you all for <clears throat> this, uh, for this, uh, uh, for your attention. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Shimtab, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on the screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Now, so let's take a look at our 
incoming questions from our audience members. Our first question, Dr. Shimtob, is, is interleukin-1 relevant in preterm labor and in pre, uh, perinatal organ injury? So this is, was the essence exactly of the presentation, that in fact, interleukin-1 sometimes <clears throat> does not seem to appear to be as significant in terms of amount generated um, in chorioamniotic membranes, as, as is the case, for example, for interleukin-6. But interestingly, interleukin-1 is really a master regulator of a number of um, actions associated with in, innate immunity. This is the case for the activation and the attraction, the migration of neutrophils and macrophages to the placenta as well as to the uterus. This is the case for the activation of microglia by interleukin-1. And it also is very important in triggering the process of, interle of generating interleukin-6, which then in turn actually establishes a, a process by which actually T regulatory cells are then transformed and inhibited and favoring the, the activation of Th1 and Th17 cells to the, uh, in the, to the detriment of actually more protective Th2 type of cells. So in essence, interleukin-1 is important in preterm labor and it is also important directly in causing damage to tissues. This is clearly demonstrated by many other laboratories, as is the case for interleukin-1 adverse effect on newborn brain and also newborn uh, retina. Hence, interleukin-1 does play a very important role in labor, and an adverse outcome to the fetus and newborn, which actually suffers from neurodevelopmental disabilities, as well as other um, adverse effects related to prematurity, as I pointed out, retinopathy of prematurity, and other uh, conditions such as where interleukin-1 also plays a role, inflammation and in lung resulting in bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Thank you, Dr. Shimtob. And I want to thank our audience members for their questions coming in and remind them that any questions not answered today will be answered via email. Our second question, Dr. Shimtob, is, is it necessary for an anti-inflammatory drug to cross placenta to exert efficacy? Yeah, so <clears throat> this, is a very, this is a very good question because one of the issues is uh, do we need to cross the placenta to exert anti-inflammatory properties? And as we see from the effect of Redvella, it does not need to cross the placenta. It does, in fact, it does not cross into the fetal placental side, and it does not cross into the fetal organs, as we've shown by actually tagging Rivella with FITC. So therefore, how is Rivella ca causing an effect? So the likelihood is that Rivella is most likely affecting the inflammatory cascade in the placenta and the chorioamniotic membranes. By suppressing these, it reaches actually these areas. It suppresses the inflammation in these areas. It doesn't need to cross into the fetal, into the fetal side. And that is sufficient, actually, by diminishing the inflammation in the placenta to actually avoid these cytokines to themselves actually 
crossing the placenta or actually being activated on the fetal side of the placenta and therefore amplifying the inflammatory process. So if we're able actually to suppress the inflammation at the interface of the materna, maternal fetal interface, then we will be able to suppress this inflammation. And this is actually what the evidence is shown in this in, by our data so far. Interestingly, Kinneret is not able actually at the dose utilized in the clinical setting is not able actually to suppress preterm labor, but it is able to decrease inflammation in the brain and also preserve to some extent adverse effects of interleukin-1 and other triggers of toll-like receptors which lead to interleukin-1 um, on the fetal side. And the reason why Kinneret is probably doing this is because probably Kinneret is affecting to a lesser extent the inflammation also on the maternal side because it does not cross the placenta. And we know this from the work of Sylvie Girard published about two years ago. It does not cross the placenta. Therefore, but on the other hand, it actually is able to suppress the inflammation uh, on the maternal fetal interface. And this is sufficient as well to decrease the inflammation on the fetal side and preserve the now, it should be pointed out that of, if we actually increase by uh, the doses of Kinneret to a pro by 25-fold what is currently um, suggested in the clinical setting, then one is able actually to suppress the effects uh, the, to, uh, to prevent preterm labor induced by interleukin-1 or LPS. And that was also recently published by our group. So therefore, it's not that Kinneret is not at all able to suppress preterm labor, but you need very high doses of Kinneret to suppress labor and preterm birth with Kinneret. And therefore, you actually put the mother in a very immunosuppressive environment. Thank you, Dr. Shimtab. Our final question that we have time for today is, what is the patient cohort that would best benefit from Ritvella without overexposing patients to that drug? Important question in terms, so who do we treat? From a clinical perspective, who do we treat? In the, you know, in preclinical studies, we control everything. But in the clinical setting is who do we treat? And I think that this is a, a major uh, question that needs to be addressed. And essentially, based on discussion with a number of clinical experts in the field, Probably the best thing would be to treat women that are at risk of preterm labor. And that means women who either had a previous history of preterm labor. But this was not, is probably not going to be sufficient to be able to identify your cohort of patients that are going to be treatable. And hence, there is a number of activity going on worldwide right now to identify markers of who actually is going to be delivering preterm. If we now combine, we're able to combine some of these markers to identify the women that are at most risk of delivering within a ne the next couple of weeks, then I think that this is going to be a major improvement in the outcome of preterm birth. And I want to highlight that our <clears throat> colleague, Dr. David Olson, is actually in the process of developing a very interesting 
leukocyte migration assay, which will enable to detect these women with a predictive value, which is in the, seems to be in the range of about 90%, positive predictive value of delivering within one to two weeks. This would be actually ideal. Fibronectin has often been used until now, but fibronectin has a very good negative predictive value, but a very poor positive predictive value. Hence, I think a combination of identifying subjects who that are at risk and subjects that, are, that uh, express markers that put them at a significant risk of delivering soon, these are the patients that would be best treated and best benefit from a treatment such, with such a, a therapeutic candidate such as Ridvella. Thank you, Dr. Shimtob, and thank you for your presentation and for your important research. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.